Red Dead Redemption 2 is a game that many consider to be one of the greatest video games of all time. Almost six years on from its release in 2018, Red Dead Redemption 2 remains as an industry standard in many aspects. Its visual fidelity not only holds up to this day, but at times is on par if not better than many modern games. The story lives on as an exciting yet tragic downfall of a gang of gunslingers trying to get one last payday in a world that is leaving their type behind, and characters that have gone down in gaming history as some of the greatest characters we've ever seen. Red Dead Redemption 2 is a game that I absolutely love. I'd consider it to be on par if not just behind The Last of Us as my favourite game of all time. I adored it when it came out, and replaying it again in 2024, my love for the game has only increased. So I figured it was time to revisit Rockstar's magnum opus, one of the greatest video games of all time. The open world, the story, the characters, the gameplay, and take a deep dive retrospective look into the timeless perfection of Red Dead Redemption 2. The story of Red Dead Redemption 2, I think, was a major surprise for everyone. I think we all expected a certain level of quality out of Rockstar for sure, but the depth and nuance in which this story was told was simply phenomenal. It's a story that focuses on the impact of industrialization on society and specifically what that means for the lawless gunslinging West, of which our characters are deeply embedded within. They sense that the world is changing, and they want one final payday to escape to paradise as they know they just don't fit in in this new society. But their leader, Dutch, constantly leads them astray, forcing them to question their loyalty to him, and of course, Dutch's mental decline, with Arthur being the main vessel in which we explore the story. Redemption also plays a huge part in the game, as the title would suggest. There's also an essence of family, revenge, and change throughout the story, and upon second playthrough, there were many things that I never really appreciated when I first played the game back in 2018. It's a deep, rich, and layered story that deserves multiple playthroughs. So let's go through that story. It is a very, very long story, so the people who do have criticisms about the game tend to point out that certain moments of the story are a little too slow. Many point their finger at the opening chapter of the game. The Vandalind gang are stuck in the mountains hiding from the law after a job gone wrong in Blackwater. We're not given the full context into exactly what went wrong, only what we can piece together from small moments of dialogue, hinting that something uncharacteristically bad happened with Dutch having a part to play. There's a lot of mystery from the past in the first chapter of the story, and a lot of time spent getting to know the members of the gang, some of which we'd seen in the first Red Dead Redemption, and some new faces as well. Again, many people say this opening chapter is too slow, and whilst I agree that yes, it is slow, I wouldn't change it for the world. If the opening chapter of the game didn't take its time in planting seeds, introducing all these characters in meaningful ways, then the payoff toward the end of the game would never have been as good as it was. The story definitely kicks up a gear in the following chapters, however. The gang make their way to Valentine with the aim of making money whilst laying low, but their past follows them, with the Pinkertons and O'Driscolls making it clear that the gang's ultimate motive of one final payday before disappearing into the sunset isn't going to be as easy as Dutch is making it out to be. And of course, it's not. Conflict arises continuously, forcing the gang to move location and lay low once again. And it's essentially rinse and repeat. You move to a new place, you lay low, you make money, but Dutch becomes increasingly unhinged as time goes by, and Arthur starts to question him more and more. So although the game does the same thing with relocating the gang a handful of times, each time is significantly different because of where the characters are at at that specific time mostly Arthur and Dutch, but also what characters aren't around anymore adds to the drama. Because you're often dealing with the fallout of what happened that forced the gang to move location. All of it eventually boils to a head with a major heist in Saint-Denis which goes wrong, seemingly a repeat of the situation in Blackwater before the events of the game. This is a major turning point in the story. It's where things really go off the rails for the gang, as if the conflicts with the Pinkertons and O'Driscolls weren't enough up until that point already. 
gang members are killed, John is captured as the heist goes suspiciously wrong, leading the gang to make a desperate escape, and they do. But through a series of unfortunate events, their boat capsizes and they end up prisoner in Guama, which is probably my least favorite portion of the game. It is fun enough, and we do get to see Dutch's violent side really start to come out, but the game returns to form when you get back to the rest of the gang. Unfortunately, by this time, the Pinkertons are right there once again waiting for them, and they are then forced to move to Beaver Hollow, the final destination of the story. This is where the game really starts to display its true colors and becomes a video game story that nobody can forget. Arthur collapses in the streets of Saint Denis and is diagnosed with tuberculosis, a progressive disease that will kill him in a matter of time. Arthur has a moment of clarity upon his diagnosis and the redemption arc kicks into full gear. We find out that Molly, one of the gang members, had tipped off the Pinkertons about the robbery in Saint Denis, showcasing that the one thing Dutch values, that being loyalty, has started to leave the gang. Going against Dutch's orders, Arthur and Sadie save John as it turns out he didn't die in the Saint Denis heist. And it's at this moment where we really see Dutch start to lose himself. Loyalty. Arthur, it ain't. I had a goddamn plan! It's no coincidence that in this scene specifically, Micah is standing right behind him. By this point, Arthur comes to a realization that he doesn't have to be Dutch's lapdog. He can die a better man. He doesn't have to be blinded by loyalty. He can redeem himself in some way. Now, it's worth noting that the first time I played through Red Dead Redemption 2, I had a high honor playthrough. So this time around, I went for a low honor ending on purpose, as by some miracle, I never had it spoiled for me. But by this point in the story, I no longer wanted the low honor ending because the redemption side of the story, I forgot how strong that it was. And Arthur is so likable that you want the best ending for him. So despite initially wanting the story to play out a certain way because I hadn't seen it before, the power of the story made me want to fight for the high honor ending, completely throwing out 30, 40 hours of game playthrough just because of how powerful the story was. Now, as the story really heats up, Dutch sets up a meeting with Leviticus Cornwall to call off the Pinkertons, and Arthur flags this immediately as another Dutch revenge quest that's going to cost more lives. By this point, Arthur is seeing straight through Dutch. It's clear to him by this point that his friend may not be worth salvaging, that the Dutch that he thought he knew might be gone. Yet Dutch seems to still have a sense of self-righteousness as per his monologue to Leviticus Cornwall. You kill, I kill. You rob, I rob. Only difference I can see is I choose whom I kill and rob, and you destroy everything in your path. By this point in the story, many gang members are starting to turn on Dutch, with Arthur and John being the main two. They can see his decline and can tell it's only a matter of time before things go beyond a point of no return, that the gang is most likely done for already. As things boil to a head, the gang sets off on a mission to help the Indians attack an oil plant. Arthur and Charles are doing so to actually help the Indians. Dutch, on the other hand, has another plan. He's always got a plan after all. Dutch masks his true intentions saying that this would help take the heat off the gang, but in reality, he wanted them to attack the oil plant so he could get the bonds there to fulfill his plan on getting the money needed to escape the West. Upon leaving the plant, however, Arthur is pinned down facing certain death. Dutch has a chance to intervene, but he walks away, putting beyond reasonable doubt that Dutch has lost his mind. And Arthur and others know that he has truly gone off the rails and is almost beyond saving, and it's time to leave the gang for good. I swear, back there, Dutch just stood and watched. If it wasn't for Eagle Flies, I'd be... I know. I feel like he's descended into the kind of man he told us never to be. Maybe. He's just become more who he really is. I don't know anymore. I just feel like a fool. Arthur then continues to question Dutch's authority by asking to let the women and children in the gang leave and sternly says as much. By this point, it is beyond clear that Dutch has had enough of Arthur's lack of faith even though it's obvious as to why. But Dutch, in his self-righteous ways, fails to see it. 
They then go on a train heist and John has seemingly been killed, although it's off screen and we don't see it. And we of course know for a fact that it's a lie as well because we play as John in the next game, but anyway. To pile onto this, Abigail was kidnapped by the Pinkertons. Naturally, Arthur wants to save her as that's what the gang would always do for one of their own. But this time, Dutch says no, indicating how far he has fallen. You're right. Dutch, Micah, it pains me to say it, Arthur, but he's right. Dutch! Come on, boys. Yeah! Arthur and Sadie go solo and save Abigail and find out that Micah has been ratting on the gang since they got back from Guama. And by this point, it's clear that Arthur has just had enough and it's time to end Dutch's madness in one way or another, forcing him to get rid of the devil on his shoulder once and for all, that being Micah, the man that has manipulated Dutch into acting on his worst impulses. Just as Arthur confronts Dutch, it's revealed, obviously, that John is still alive. And despite Arthur making it clear that Micah is a rat, Dutch is too far gone by this point and draws the line in the sand, to which it's only Arthur and John left against him. At this point, Arthur knows his time is coming to an end, and he wants to help John return to his family, topping off the redemption he's undergone throughout Dutch's downfall. The Pinkertons interrupt the standoff, and as they escape, Arthur's horse is killed, which is completely heartbreaking. Come on, brother. Let's go. Give me a second. Come on. Push, Arthur. Thank you. Arthur! This is where Arthur chooses to hold off the Pinkertons to allow John to live and to get to his family, ending his life with a redeeming act. But Micah and Dutch are still there. We see Arthur and Micah fight to the death. The fight pushes Arthur to his physical limit and his sickness has gotten the better of him and he's only moments from death. He almost reaches a gun to kill Micah, but Dutch intervenes. It is over now. Arthur. It's over. Oh, Dutch. He's right. You know it, and I know it. He's sick. He's dying. He's talking crazy. Come on, Dutch. Let's go, buddy. We made it. <laughs> we won. Come on. John made it. He's the only one. <laughs> the rest of us. No. But I tried. In the end, I did. Come on. Let's go. We can make it. Come on, Dutch. Come on! Arthur's dying words actually have an impact on Dutch, and for the first time in the story, Dutch walks away from Micah. Now, depending on your honor level, Arthur crawls to the edge of a cliff and passes away peacefully as the sun rises. But if you got the low honor ending, which is what my recent playthrough was, Arthur dies at the hands of Micah. Both endings are heart-wrenching in their own way. There are two other identical endings that take place at the camp, but the result is essentially the same regardless. Fact of the matter is, Arthur is dead, marking the death of one of the greatest video game characters to ever exist. And it's topped off by an incredible soundtrack. 
It's truly one of the most emotional moments I've ever had playing a video game. And I know we're just doing the cliff notes part of the story here for this video because we could realistically do this for hours, but it just still hits so hard. Almost six years later, even though I knew Arthur's death was coming, it's just as powerful as I remember. But the story isn't done there. We switch characters and play as John in the epilogue to set up the events of Red Dead Redemption. We see John battle with the new life he's trying to create due to Arthur's sacrifice, trading in the gunslinger lifestyle to a ranch hand that works to provide for his family. Not only to please Abigail, but to honor Arthur's sacrifice to help him escape. The epilogue does drag on a little bit if I was to nitpick, but I completely understand why Rockstar felt the need to spend so much time playing as John. It helps you appreciate and process the loss of Arthur, rather than just rolling credits. We see John's struggles to go straight, the building of his ranch, and his proposal to Abigail with the ring Arthur had in his satchel. In a way, Arthur's legacy is John and his family. By the epilogue's end, we start to hear word of Micah floating around from Sadie, and of course, it builds to a final confrontation with Micah. By this point, all we want to do as the player is just put a bullet in his head, and thankfully, we group up with Sadie and Charles and set on a journey to do so. To John's surprise, Dutch is with Micah to retrieve the stash left at Beaver's Hollow, but it's not lost on Dutch that Micah was a rat. And of course, that Micah was a major reason as to why the gang was torn apart. It's clear that Arthur's dying words truly did get through to Dutch, so he kills Micah and walks away a defeated and broken man. He leaves the stash behind for John to take. Using the stash, Sadie, Charles, and John all get their happy ending, going their separate ways to live their lives peacefully. But we of course know that John doesn't get to live happily ever after. This story is simply phenomenal. And the only way to do it true justice would be to do a five hour video talking about just the story itself. We obviously just kind of went over the Cliff Notes version because this game just offers so much more than the story and we've got to get to all of it. But seeing the slow decay of a gang of outlaws that you can't help but love is hard to watch, but in an amazing way. The care the writers put into this story is top shelf and is without doubt one of the best video game stories ever told. It's a slow burn at times, but because of that, when it all comes to a head, the ending is so much more impactful, and it's an ending that sticks with you long after the credits roll. Red Dead Redemption 2 is the kind of game where you can talk about the characters for hours on end. Normally when I make these kinds of videos, I group the characters in with the story section, but this game, the characters deserve their own spotlight. Arthur and Dutch are obviously the main two characters with the most depth here, but what surprised me was just about every single character within the gang itself got an arc of some kind, whether it was necessary for the game's story or not. There are a couple that go a little underdeveloped, sure, but characters like Reverend Swanson goes from a bumbling drunk to a man put together that leaves before the gang's inevitable collapse, and also gives Arthur some really good advice. Sadie goes from a mourning widow to a badass bounty hunter, and even Kieran goes from a man with a head to a man without one. No, but seriously, he goes from an O'Driscoll to a Vanderlyn, which is pretty cool. John also goes from a gunslinger to a family man, at least for now. Moral of the story, minor characters go on arcs of their own in the background, and you only really see it if you engage with them in camp. Now obviously John's no minor character, but he is on the sidelines for major portions of the game as to not take the spotlight away from Arthur, but he's still undergoing an arc in the background. And then there's Micah. Well, My Micah's just a prick. But he does rise up the ranks of the gang and goes from the hothead who's good in a fight to someone who has managed to manipulate Dutch into acting on his dormant impulses. But when you discuss the characters of Red Dead 2, you go to the two main pillars that hold this game up to be as iconic as it is, and that's obviously Arthur and Dutch. I find both of these characters extremely fascinating. A lot of the spotlight tends to get put on Arthur as one of the greatest video game characters of all time, which I totally agree with, but in my opinion, I think Dutch is right up there with him. So let's start with Dutch, because this character is wildly fascinating and so incredibly complex and layered 
that people still discuss his decline six years on from the game's release. Many people make the argument that Dutch declined as a person and started as a somewhat decent man, at least for an outlaw, but regressed into a bad man. On the other hand, many people make the argument that he was always a bad man, but just got worse at hiding it as the game progressed. I tend to agree with the latter. I think Dutch was always a bad man, but the events of the game and stress put on him by the gang's dwindling faith broke him down over time. And on top of that, you have Micah on his shoulder bringing out the dormant monster hiding behind the facade of an admired leader. At the beginning of the game, Dutch had values, values that he forced the gang to live by. But as you progress throughout the game, you see him contradict those very values. For example, early in the game, Dutch says that revenge is a luxury that we can't afford. Obviously, throughout the game, that code is abandoned by Dutch himself. He also says this to Kieran. I got a saying, my friend. You shoot fellas as need shooting. Save fellas as need saving. And feed them as need feeding. We are going to find out what you need. Now flash forward to the end of the game and Dutch refuses to save people that need saving multiple times. Not just random people, longtime members of the gang with John and Abigail. This is also the same man that left Arthur for dead when he could have easily intervened, indicating how much Dutch's values withered away as the game progressed. But you could also make the argument that those values never existed. It was all a part of the facade. Again, that's why discussing this character is so interesting. At the beginning of the game, you as the player are drawn into Dutch's charisma and leadership, much like the characters are. Just about all of the gang members have an unshakable loyalty to him, which carries on quite far into the game. All of the gang members refuse to hand him over to Milton. Flash forward to the end of the game and almost every single member wanted to get as far away from him as possible. The game has many major moments that send Dutch off the rails, but I think the biggest catalyst by far in Dutch's decline was the death of Hosea. Hosea was the voice of reason that kept Dutch's true self at bay for so long. But without him and Micah in Hosea's place, the dormant monster came out. If Hosea never died, this story would have played out completely different. Dutch would have remained a little more level-headed. I'm not saying he wouldn't have gone off the rails and gone a step too far with certain acts, as he was always prone to do that. But Hosea's death essentially broke the shackles off of Dutch's madness completely. And Micah was there fueling Dutch's ego, whereas Hosea would keep it in check as the voice of reason. When the dominoes start to fall and everything goes wrong, Dutch is simply incapable of accepting that he has a major role as to why. He blames anyone he can but himself, blaming the fading loyalty of characters like Arthur and John as to why the gang are in a bad situation. Or he'll just blame it on bad luck, rather than his egotistical decision making that led them to that point. Now Dutch isn't just battling himself, the gang, the Pinkertons, the O'Driscolls, but he's battling the new world, the evolution of society that's quickly leaving relics of the past like him behind, which just adds to his downfall. There's a lot going on for him. Toward the end of the game, things get seriously complicated for Dutch. Arthur and John were like sons to him, yet they are the main two that turn on him. They've warned him about Micah, but Dutch in his hubris fails to see it. He'd rather side with someone who fuels his ego than someone who questions it, regardless if they were like sons to him or not. That's one of the reasons why I think Dutch was always a bad person. There's no way a good man, at least in an outlaw's sense, who's lost his way could go down the path of siding with a homicidal maniac like Micah and be quick to kill or leave for dead two people who were like sons to him. It's because deep down, Dutch is more like Micah. He always was. It just took the death of Hosea, questioned loyalty, the pressure of the new world, and constant failure that brought it out. At the end of the game, we finally see Dutch actually pause for a minute to see that he potentially did make a mistake, that somewhere along the line, he did lose himself. The fact he walks away from Micah is evidence of that, but at the same time, he also walks away from a dying Arthur. He's confused, he's angry, he feels betrayed by not only his companions, but betrayed by himself, and the road that leads him down eventually isn't a good one. It is picked up a little bit in the epilogue, and it's clear that Dutch is just a defeated man at this point. Say something, Dutch. 
Say something! I ain't got too much to say no more. I find Dutch to be one of the more interesting antagonistic characters I have ever seen in a video game. There's simply so many layers to peel back for this character and when I play the game again someday, which I will do, I have no doubt I'm going to uncover so much more about this character that I didn't spot in my first two playthroughs. These characters are that layered that you can uncover something new every single time you play and that's the sign of an incredible character. Now, we of course can't talk about characters without talking about Arthur frickin Morgan, who is straight up one of the best video game characters to ever exist. Arthur's story is just incredible. He started out as a young delinquent who was essentially raised by Dutch and the gang. He's a killer with a sense of honor. He's a bad man, but not beyond reason. If there's a job to do, he'll do it, but he maintains his moral compass, at least to some degree, for an outlaw. As amazing as this game is, at its core, it's essentially a character study for Arthur Morgan. But what made this character so great? Well, I mean, where do we even start? When we first meet Arthur, he's a stereotypical outlaw. He's had a tough upbringing. He's part of a gang with a code. He will do what is necessary for the safety of himself and his gang. But there's a likable aspect to him. Most of it comes from Roger Clark's incredible performance. They got Micah and the sheriffs in Strawberry. And there's talk of hanging them. Here's open. Arthur, what? There's also inserted backstory through side missions with Mary Linton, where we see more of Arthur's life before the events of the game. We learned that he had a son and has always dealt with his label of an outlaw despite wanting a different life for himself. These are the kinds of things that you only find if you do the extra side missions. Now, as sad and tragic as Arthur's story is, He's got a sense of humor. He's naturally likable despite sometimes doing some pretty bad shit. You go through the early areas of the game doing some pretty messed up stuff as Arthur, but if you read his journal, you get a bit more insight as to how he really feels about the things he does in the name of loyalty to his gang and Dutch. Arthur says something in the game that summarizes the character perfectly. Be loyal to what matters. And he stayed true to that from beginning to end despite having such a massive arc throughout the story. There were many great moments I remember from my high honor playthrough, such as the famous I'm afraid scene, which is without question one of the best of the game. I didn't get it this time round, as to my knowledge, it's a high honor only cutscene, but that remains etched in my mind all these years later. Arthur's story is ultimately one of redemption. He goes from a man who beat to death a dying father for a few dollars to sacrificing himself for a chance, not a guarantee, a chance for someone else to have a better life. When faced with his own mortality, Arthur begins to act on the dormant feelings he's had whilst doing bad things. He's essentially the opposite of Dutch. Dutch was basically a bad man pretending to be good for the good of the gang. And Arthur was a good man pretending to be bad for the good of the gang. It's a little more complicated than that, sure, but I think it's a valid statement to make. The game's story brought out the real Dutch, and the game's story brought out the real Arthur. And I love that parallel between the characters. Arthur also has strong parallels with Micah. On the surface, at least at the start of the game, they're both bad men. They do bad things. But the difference is, one enjoys it, and one deep down despises it. And although Arthur and Micah seem similar early in the game, we see how drastically different they both are by the end. Now, when coming face to face with his own mortality later in the game, Arthur chooses to accept that his end is inevitable, but he can still help others live a better life. And that's ultimately the driving force for the final third of the game. Every time Arthur coughed, it was a stark reminder that his death is close. And as the player, that's really hard to take. Even though Arthur is the vessel in which you're experiencing the story, you still feel like you're externally watching a friend go headfirst into their own death. It creates this depressing feeling as the player, but a hunger to right wrongs at the same time, to give a character that you know is going to die the best ending you can possibly give them. Earlier in the game, Arthur knows that the things he's doing are bad, but in a way are justified, as his loyalty to the gang is his priority. As loyalty is the most important thing to Dutch, Arthur is essentially a reflection of that. He'll get his hands dirty to help support the gang because he's the enforcer, he's the best shot, and he has his role to play. And whether he likes it or not, he plays that role. 
until he comes to realize who Dutch really is, where his loyalty actually got him. And at that point, he questions everything. It's really fascinating how it all weaves together. If you really crank through the side quest toward the end of the game, you realize just how far Arthur has come on his redemption. Early in the game, Arthur kills a dying father for a few bucks, collecting a small bounty, and that man is the one that gave him tuberculosis. So he essentially got himself killed for something so minuscule, doing an act that he'd rather not be doing. So when confronted with the family of which he took the bounty from, he's quick to do what he can to help them. I ain't looking for forgiveness. It ain't about that. Don't forgive me. Just take the money and get out of here. Please. I know I ruined your life. I suffer for it every day. But don't let yourself get killed for, for pride. I've seen it kill too many folk. <sighs> don't say anything. Don't thank me. Just take the money and pack your bags. That's all I gotta say. Thank you, Mr. Morgan. I said don't thank me. Get out of here. Arthur doesn't want a thank you, he just wants to do some good in this world before his inevitable end. He just needs that. In a way, to at least try and right some of his wrongs that he committed because of his blind loyalty to Dutch. Arthur's final act of loyalty toward Dutch is exposing Micah as the rat in the group. By this point, Arthur had every reason to just leave. He saved Abigail, but his loyalty carries through all the way to the very end. He knows the second he outs Micah as a rat, things aren't going to go well, but he does it anyway. He's loyal to Dutch the entire way through, which is exemplified just before his death. He gave Dutch everything he had to make him see the truth, to help his friend to remain loyal. Yet Dutch still turned on him. It's only then Dutch realizes his failure, but by this point, it's too late. Arthur is on death's doorstep and the gang has been destroyed. It's honestly just heartbreaking, man. Like, it's such a sad story. Now, Arthur's redemption is kind of bittersweet too, as we know that his sacrifice leads to John's death and Jack turning outlaw to avenge John. So, some people say Arthur's redemption is actually pointless, which I must say I strongly disagree with. That's why the epilogue to the game exists. John managed to reunite with his family. He managed to build a house to have a chance of trying to be a better man. That chance was because of Arthur. The times of peace and happiness John got before things went south in the events of the first game were because of Arthur's final act. It may not have lasted forever, but nothing lasts forever. The passing of the hat between Arthur and John also just means so much. The passing of the mantle for a player, but John carries these items with him in a way, honoring Arthur's sacrifice. And he proposes to Abigail using Arthur's ring. Arthur lives on through John and his family, and I love that. That's how they tie the two protagonists together. It's perfect. Arthur is just a character that feels real. A character that feels like a friend as opposed to a vessel that takes an audience through a story in a video game. He is truly one of the greatest, if not the single greatest video game character of all time. And I could talk for hours as to why this character is so great. But again, we're trying to cover a lot of bases in this video. Arthur is simply a phenomenal character through and through one of the very best. So now that we've got the story and characters out of the way, let's get into the open world of Red Dead Redemption 2. This game essentially ruined open world games for me because I've yet to come across anything in the past six years that tops it. Whenever I play an open world game without even meaning to, I subconsciously compare it to Red Dead 2 because I still think it's the best open world game ever made and I don't even know how it's realistically going to be topped unless Rockstar knock GTA 6 out of the park, or they make a Red Dead Redemption 3. I just feel like the only people who could possibly top Red Dead 2 in an open world sense are the people that made Red Dead 2. What they managed to build here is an incredibly alive and immersive open world, a place where you can get sidetracked and end up doing hours of content off the beaten path with ease. I remember halfway through my playthrough, I went up into the mountains to have a look around and I literally spent four hours there just exploring. No game has made me do that in a long, long time. 
There's always something to find, something to do, something to get lost in. And it doesn't matter where in this sprawling open world you are, there's always something waiting behind every corner. Random NPC interactions are a standout and make the world feel alive. They comment on your appearance. If you buy a new horse, they comment on the horse. If Arthur is filthy, they'll say it. It actually feels like you're taking part in a living and breathing world. You can be ambushed by other outlaws. You can face repercussions for things you did 20 hours ago in your playthrough. The game seemingly doesn't forget your actions, and I love that. It helps that the setting itself is incredibly diverse. You have deserts, open spaces, canyons, snowy mountains, forests, swamps, time accurate cities. They just about have all bases covered for where you can go. And the environments themselves have a role to play. If you're in the snowy mountains and you don't have the appropriate clothing, it actually affects you. Same goes if you're wearing layers of clothing in a hot environment. It helps add to the feeling of immersion you get when exploring the world. And the world is put together so well by Rockstar that it still holds up to this day. Visuals don't represent objective game quality, but it definitely helps when the game looks as good as this. The world is your playground, and why would you not want to explore every nook and cranny when it looks so good? Now granted, the footage you're watching was recorded at 4K on PC, completely maxed out settings, and I hope YouTube's compression doesn't diminish the quality of what this game was like to play through in a visual sense. I'd often just slowly walk around and take in the visuals, the atmosphere, the lighting, and just be totally lost in this world. The environmental storytelling is also next level. You get a sense of the time period, the ushering in of the industrial age, just from walking down the streets of Saint Denis. The thought and care put into this world is unbelievable. Now spread across the open world is essentially endless content. Side missions are absolutely everywhere and unlike many open world games nowadays, the side content is actually worth doing. Not all side missions are a home run, but some of them are just as exciting, if not better, than many main story missions. Stumbling across a stranger and actually engaging with the content is worthwhile. There is endless hours of content here. 100%ing this game is something that I want to do someday, but the amount of time needed to do so is just insane. Now, any developer can fill their world with a stupid amount of content that's overwhelming and totally not worth it. Look at many Ubisoft titles, for example. But that's one of the things that separates Red Dead 2 from other open world games. The filler content spread throughout the map is actually worth doing, and there's so much of it. Even though I've put well over 150 hours into Red Dead 2, I only figured out a week ago that there's a vampire side mission. Like, that's just insane. There is just so much to do in this world. You can hunt animals, you can collect bounties, side missions, rob people, banks, stores, trains, fish, Easter eggs, shop, horse breaking, gambling, mini games, like it just doesn't end. Now granted, not all of these activities are fun to do, like the fishing for example is kind of boring, but it's there, it's an option. I'm just always in a constant state of amazement when exploring this world. I still think to this day, it's just the best open world that we have. Now, when it comes to gameplay, this is where some people take issue with Red Dead 2. Most people tend to agree that the story is phenomenal, the characters are iconic, and the open world is one of, if not the best ever created. But the gameplay is where people tend to find chinks in the armor of Red Dead 2. Now, I'd be remiss to ignore that the gameplay in some areas has its problems, but it's nothing that can even begin to ruin my experience with the game. Sometimes if you're in a confined space, moving around to shoot or engage in hand-to-hand -hand combat, it can be a little ragdolly, you know, a little bit clunky, but apart from that, I think everything works pretty much perfectly. The ragdoll physics tend to be a go-to for people that for some reason just hate this game, whilst in some areas, sure, it can be annoying, like what I mentioned earlier, but at worst, the ragdoll physics, I think, are just absolutely hilarious. Now, the snap aiming tends to be something that you either love or you hate, Personally, I like this snap aiming. It feels like it would just be ridiculously hard to hit targets without it, especially when you're riding on horseback, which is an obstacle they would have had to overcome when they were making the game. But playing the first Red Dead, the snap aiming is way more immediate and snappy, if that's even a way to describe it. 
but here in the sequel it's a little more relaxed but it is a lot of hide behind cover aim move the stick up slightly for a headshot and shoot but it is satisfying and even if it is a flawed system it is still fun and i think that's just the most important thing if your game mechanic isn't great but it's fun then realistically who cares same goes for the dead eye feature. Some people see it as a bit of a cop out during difficult situations, but I just find it awesome. Lining up half a dozen people and ending them all in the dead eye animation is a load of fun. The shooting in general in this game is great overall. Rifles do what a rifle should do. Pistols at times can feel a little bit underpowered, especially if you don't maintain them. And shotguns are just insanely brutal. Now, traversing the world means you spend a lot of time on horseback, and although I wouldn't say the horse mechanics are flawless, I think it's still incredibly strong. There's only really issues when you're around steep areas or dense forests. But 99% of the time, riding on horseback feels smooth, weighty, and engaging, especially as you increase your bond with your horse and can do extra maneuvers. Now, one thing that really did strike me when jumping back into Red Dead 2 again was that in a gameplay sense, it can be quite slow. A lot of riding around, a lot of time on horseback, and for some people, this might not be their thing. They want to explore the map much faster, but given how good the game looks and how alive the world feels, I love the extra time spent riding around on horseback. It gives you that gunslinger western experience that you're probably after. Now, hand-to-hand -hand combat is one area of the game that I feel is maybe a little off. A lot of it is waiting for a parry, punching someone once or twice, and then rinse and repeat until they get knocked out or die. It's not terrible, but there are a lot of games that do hand-to-hand -hand combat better. Just recently, I played through The Last of Us Part 2 again, and the hand-to-hand -hand combat in that game definitely feels much better than it does here. To be honest though, most of the time, I just pulled out a shotgun and shot someone in the face anyway, so it's kind of not a problem if you just do that. And I think the general gameplay loop of Red Dead 2, it's just fun. You do a mission, then a new mission unlocks, quite often forcing you to traverse the world, and along the way you get a random NPC interaction, a side quest, something to do, and then you eventually end up at the next main mission. It's a fun gameplay loop, and it does keep you wanting more. I'd often want to power through the missions as the story was just so engaging, but along the way I'd get sidetracked because there was something I wanted to do, or items that I wanted to progress. As the progression is very complex, and almost every aspect of the game can be leveled up in some way. So in a gameplay sense, I think it's maybe the weakest aspect of the Red Dead 2 experience, which is really saying something about the quality of the game, because the gameplay is excellent. It's just not really the star of the show. The story, the characters, the open world tend to be at the forefront. And then you have what is still very good gameplay to mesh into it. It's just a fun gameplay experience. Red Dead Redemption 2 is ultimately one of the best video games ever made. And in my opinion, still to this day, the best open world game ever made. It truly felt like all the stars aligned to create a game that anybody can love. That's so rich with things to do, places to explore, stories to get immersed into, and characters to love. It's pretty impressive that I can open up a game in 2024 that came out six years ago and just lose myself just as much as the first time I played it. The graphics may age eventually, but the story and characters will live on as some of the best ever in a video game. For many people, Red Dead Redemption 2 is more than a video game, and given the mastery on display here, it's not hard to see why.